All right, folks, we are gonna kick off our fall edition of Evenings with Artifacts. Welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Heather Nickerson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Artifacts, and we are thrilled to have you with us tonight. I'm gonna to turn it over to my co-founder, Ellen Goodwin, to introduce herself, and then also our esteemed guest for the evening. We look forward to the conversation with all of you. If at any point you do have questions, please pop them in the chat. And we intend for this to be a very interactive discussion. So but without further ado, over to Ellen. Thank you, Heather. Hi, everybody. Ellen Goodwin. I'm calling in from Austin, Texas. And I would like to say I have personally willed it to have cooler temperatures by wearing my fall blazer. Um, we went from 90 to 42 degrees. I win. Uh, so this is a victory here at Artifacts. <laughs> uh, as Heather said, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Bob Jordan. Bob is a retired anchor from WGN Television in Chicago. And actually the first time we met, he, get on, he got on the call and I heard his voice and I had a flashback to being a child and going to visit family in Chicago. I recognized the voice. It was amazing. <laughs> so this is oh, a really fun, great. it's a fun Thank flashback. You. Yeah. So yeah, um, Bob, I'm going to let you say hello and talk a little bit about what you've been doing since WGN, because that relates directly to why you're here this evening. It really does. And it all started, like many things do, by accident. I was doing a favor for a friend, and she died, and her children. She was um, uh, a widow and um, with five adult children. When I was out of town, they invited me over and said, hey, we're at mom's house now. So I went over, and we chatted, and they had photographs spread all over the floor. And um, I got this idea and asked to borrow some of the pictures and said, I'll get them back to you. And they wanted to know why. I said, oh, I'll tell you. So I took them into the station and uh, wrote up a little three or four minute story about her life using the photographs, added music. But what they didn't know was that I had a cassette of her, many of you are saying, what's a cassette? A cassette of her singing a lullaby a cappella that I ended the CD with. And I burned uh, copies and gave it to them. And they said it was the greatest gift they'd ever had. So I thought about this and I talked to my wife and I said, you know, these biographies really seem like something I'd like to do, but I want to do them documentary style where you interview lots of people and tell a long story that really is all encompassing. And I said, no one could afford it. And she said, well, wealthy families could. So I began looking at family offices and, um, and I uh, am on the board of the Shed Aquarium here in Chicago. And one of the families who are dear friends of ours have ancestors who started Northern Trust Bank. And uh, so I asked um, Steve and Mary Smith what they thought about it. And they said, it's a great idea. Go see so-and-so at the bank. I did. They invited me to speak at a gathering of ultra high net worth families in Naples. And I came away with three commissions and that was the beginning of the business. It's a kismet kind of thing. I, I love wow. these, uh, how that happens, absolutely. And yeah. I'm eager for everyone to have this conversation with us tonight because I think that you offer something very unique which is the professional storytelling both in front of and behind the lens. And that's what we told people, right? Because not, Everyone has the comfort that you do in processing through all the questions and doing it in front of a lens in any sense, right? We have people write to us at Artifacts who, who ask us about the audio only feature versus the video feature, and they're not sure they're ready for the camera. And so I think it's really great to have a discussion with you where we can get into the storytelling tips and, and everything like that, because with the videographies, you're working with family members that are yanked into the process <laughs> because oh. they're they're voluntold that they will participate in videographies with with their family. So I, I think that one of the things that you and I have discussed a lot that I think our audience would love to hear about is you said your number one rule when you're talking with families and prepping for it is get, getting them to resist the impulse to throw away all their history. Oh, can absolutely. You, can you speak oh, to I that first? How often we deal with families who will tell us, we're dealing with a family right now. So it's a very prominent family uh, in Cincinnati. And they had a flood. 
and had all of their photos in the basement in a box or boxes, and they were all ruined. And so, and they've had a family squabble. And so being able to get photos from other branches of the family is not going to be easy. Sometimes we can do that because there's a common good in getting the story told. So many times they'll do that. But those are sometimes it'll be a fire. So having or just old age, having the photos stuck together or the VHS tapes um, have uh, just faded and are no longer uh, very good. Those are the things we encounter all the time. Another thing that you rarely think would happen is having the photographs, but then turning the pages and not knowing who's there. Because if these are older individuals and the grandkids are going through, they may not know who friends of the family are or who distant nieces and nephews will be. So it's really important to be able to label photographs. And that's one of the wonderful features that Artifacts offers, along with the, uh, the, the wonderful feature of making it so easy to do. And I have to admit that I'm kind of a Luddite sometimes when it comes to some things. But just today, Ellen and I were talking, and she was talking about how easy it was to take photographs from the phone and using the app that is on the phone, which there it is right there, you can just access the uh, Artifacts app and take your photographs and put them right in. I did it and it was less than 10 seconds. And then you can label them and do whatever you have to do to make sure that you don't lose the, the really important uh, little tidbits about a photo that make it interesting. And those are the things that you can label right at the moment that you'll forget later. But if you, what made you want to take that photograph right now? Whatever it was, you need to try and record. And if you can do that, that little tidbit of information is everlasting. And your great grandchildren will know what prompted you to take that photo of someone at a Ferris wheel. Why? Because of whatever it was. So that's one of the benefits, uh, one of the many benefits of artifacts. I love it. And um, I have not been using it as much as I will be using it, but I have lots and lots. My mother um, made 11 trips to Africa over the years and uh, began collecting African art. She used to joke that she and Rockefeller were the only people who were collecting African art in the 40s. Well, she, as it turns out, had some museum quality pieces that my brother and I now share. And so, um, you know, I've begun to uh, store them and have the information in artifacts that I can put private, but it also helps with provenance at some point if we decided to sell, which of course we won't, but we also have other art that we made. Or when I pass it on to my daughter, it'll help her have a better understanding of what it is that we have. And it just helps with the provenance of the pieces. And um, so when you have it insured and knowing the story, stories behind the pieces is also something else we'll get to, I hope, a bit later. Oh, yes, we absolutely will. But you're right. You know, you started on the photographs and being how powerful they are in the hands of the storyteller, the per person that took the photo or participated in it. So you can't really just throw a photo of them on your lap and say, hey, Mr. Videographer, go for it. It's just not going to happen. You need, right. <laughs> you need a little more context than that. No, that's fabulous. And, and, and we and all, we, I bet I have 5,000 photos on here. And now it's drudgery to have to go through and find those gems that are here. So now that I have promised myself that I will be more diligent about uploading specific photos into artifacts so easily, I'm going to do that. And I'll be um, less likely to, then I can still store the others in on my iPhone but I'll have, I know, the best ones there with 
the uh, anecdotes surrounding them also tied into the photo. And this is not a paid advertisement, folks. I didn't tell him to say these things. Oh. <laughs> Very good luck on my part. <laughs> so now, true, you you also, this happens to be, you stepped on a beautiful topic in what you just said. This happens to be a state planning awareness week. Oh. And you talked about being the preparedness aspect of, of why you're telling the stories and why you're capturing the stories and why you work with families to do so. Um, the family stories are a part of being prepared in life because you never know when right. it's going to be too late to ask those questions. You've told me some really great stories about this. I would love if you would talk about that part of your work and, and where you discover families are meeting some resistance and getting the stories out there and how you keep them moving forward because sure. that's an important part of preparedness as well. Well, it's very personal for me. When I had my first video camera, I was living in Chicago at the time and went home to Atlanta uh, to visit my parents, and my mother was taking me through the house, telling me about some of the pieces that she had collected, and she's telling little stories and tidbits behind uh, some of the pieces she'd collected all over the continent of Africa. My father walked in, and I just looked around and said, hey, Dad, I didn't even turn the camera around to get him on it, you know, I just, hey, thinking I'll get him later. He left, went back out to a meeting, so I missed him that night. The next night, uh, something happened, so I didn't get him that trip, thinking I'll get him the next trip. My father died of a heart attack early in life, so I never got him on video. And he took to his grave the, the answers to thousands of questions that I have for him. So I tell people, you know, one of the great things about a cell phone is the ability to ask questions and do that if you can. Um, so the oldest living member of your family, find that person. And once you have them sit down, ask them, what can you tell me about your grandparents? Because most of us know our grandparents. So now you're back three more generations with the oldest living person in your family. So think about how much information he or she is able to share. So you get that and you, you've got it in the can, as we call it. So you can breathe a little easier knowing that you have that. So if later you decide to do something more formal in putting together a family video, or something along those lines, you can then, then do that. You can save that video, protect it, so that you can use it at a later date. But you have that person then, and you have uh, you know, really valuable video. So I urge people to do that whenever they can. And then come back and get mom and dad, if you can, because just once you start, it really gets the ball rolling. And a lot of times people will say, well, you know, dad was kind of grumpy. He didn't like talking about family history or whatever. Ask him questions like, how did you meet mom? Or, and then ask mom, how did you meet dad? Those are, you rarely get the same answer from both parents, by the way. And uh, get them started with that. And then you, they, they warm up and they begin to want to talk. They're thinking about those days. And <clears throat> then you can generally get them talking about um, their childhoods. And what did you like doing when you were growing up? What was it like? Uh, did you like sports? Um, who taught you how to swim? Uh, who taught you how to catch? Uh, those sorts of things. Questions like that get their minds rolling, you know? And I, I think, Bob, that that's one of the things that we love at Artifacts is, is doing the same with objects. And recently I was at an event and I actually brought with me my mother's bright red coat. And it was this full length. She, she went to school in Chicago uh, University, bright, long wool red coat, super bright. And I grabbed it out of my parents' closet because my father spotted it. And he said, oh, 
you need to artifact that, which was really funny to hear from him. So I bring it downstairs and my mother sees it and she just lights up. She's like, my red coat, where was it <laughs> you know, for the last 45 years? <laughs> you know, I've never seen her wear this, right. but it elicited this story of I was in college and your dad could spot me across campus. And, you know, but I think you're right. It, one, one, one trigger and you start that, that ball rolling. Yes. Another, um, so you transition beautifully into some of your story sharing tips, one of which is, is finding those very simple questions that for that person will work. Uh, the how did you meet type of question. The second point that you brought up with me the other day was being ready to shine a light on the ghosts of the past. Can you tell our audience what you mean by this? Because I thought it was very well put. Yes, we call it the ghosts and the shadows. They're, they're in all of our lives. And we know that they are there. Sometimes we try to forget them. But the shadows are things in our lives that if we shine a light on them, they can go away. But the ghosts are the memories sometimes in our lives that without us shining a light on them, they can become scary. So we need to address both the ghosts and the shadows. And by looking at those and discussing them, it really puts a light on them. And the ghosts are no longer so scary once you bring them out and begin to talk about them, whatever it was. Was it um, what caused the separation between you and Aunt Susie? What was that about? You know, you get them talking or what happened with you and mom or you and dad. Uh, those can be ghosts um, that left alone can become scary. So I like to talk to families about those things because many times they fear that mentioning these will, you know, are, are scary items to bring up. And I don't know what I'll say. I don't know how I'm going to address that. It's the same thing that some families deal with when they send off for DNA information, not knowing what's going to be revealed. You know, are there outside children? Um, are there, am I related to someone I didn't know? All of those things can sometimes be ghosts or shadows, but shining a light on it can, can really make a big difference in it. And it makes it something that's palatable and sometimes it'll, you, it'll draw you into it and make you want to learn more about that topic. And, um, and then it's no longer scary. I love that advice. And you know, us being a little playful here at Artifacts, we do have an article that we'll be publishing later this month about genealogy and family history research through cemeteries. And one of the points that we make is actually, are you sure you want to know? Because, you know, there's the, if you get to the, the the cemetery and you discover someone's buried between grandma and grandpa or there's a fifth kid that you didn't know about, like, are you ready to absorb this information and and also think twice before you share that information and, and how people will react and, and be, be prepared for that. Um, we have a lot of really interesting examples of that and we have a fun surprise that will be in the piece for folks about what, what one artifacts member discovered when she went to her family's plot here in Texas, it was it was uh, one for the history books, so to speak. So uh, we're gonna have a little fun with that later this month. But to your point, it's it's really interesting because you can uncover a lot of family history just by exposing those ghosts, and and I think that's part of your point. Absolutely. Well. And also, I might add, cemeteries are great places to learn a lot of information. If you can go back in some of the old uh, Catholic cemeteries, for instance, you can find the cherubs and the angels and the statuary in these cemeteries is just marvelous. Um, and much of it is symbolic and has meaning. Um, and, you know, whether there's a knob on top here or an acorn here, or they all have symbolic meaning. And um, I used to know a lot of it, I've forgotten, but um, 
yeah, when you go through, you can find a lot of wonderful information. And when you travel, you know, if you get a chance to go to older European cities, like the, the, the cemetery in Paris is known for um, being just a, a great tourist spot. People go through just to marvel at uh, many of the wonderful, well-known people who are buried there and look at the, the types of uh, headstones and, and that sort of thing. Here in Chicago, we have uh, Graceland Cemetery, where most of the people there, uh, we have streets, streets named after many of the people who were buried there in that cemetery. And there are all kinds of examples of, um, you know, just wonderful kinds of information there. It's a great yeah, cemetery to go through. Yeah, and Legacy Tree Genealogists, it's a company that we'll reference in our cemetery piece because today they published a piece talking about symbolism on tombstones yeah. and grave work. Oh, did they? It's a beautiful, um, you know, synergy with the piece that we we offered. So we'll we'll make sure we're including that link in our yeah. story as well. When you've done some family videographies, have you often had done the the geneal genealogy or even you know, cemetery is a very specific example of research? But how often does the storytelling involve? the genealogy aspect, or is it more referenced in the context of here's a photo of that person or here's where the family originated from? How much of the story sharing aspect is, is around that? Well, our videos are 90 minutes, so they're like movies. And we break them up into chapters. And uh, we try to have a chapter on genealogy if the family uh, so wishes. Uh, but we go back as far as we can using old photographs, old documents. I collaborate with a company in Salt Lake City called Legacy Tree Genealogists, and they are just wonderful. They can trace it back to uh, when the family came to this country, and then they'll pick it up in the old country with their uh, connections to genealogists in the old country where the family is originally from and then they can take it on back even further. In the case of black families, it goes back to generally to slavery. And then you hit a, a wall because the information stops. And um, they're beginning to try and use uh, genealogy or rather um, um, DNA uh, if they can, but that generally only helps with um, telling of, of generalized areas that people are from and that sort of thing. But in some cases, there are records. And if you're lucky enough uh, with Black families to find uh, jumps and that sort of thing, they can trace it back. But it's, it's really tough. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, we do try to uh, include that much information as we can as a special separate chapter in telling the story. I think that's important because um, at here at Artifacts, we hear a lot from genealogists who cannot get their families to listen to the stories, right? And so part of the attraction of Artifacts is actually the storytelling piece, right? The bite size pieces with the photo video audio that can convey the stories by connecting the dots. And so I think that's really valuable as part of a documentary and the story sharing aspect. Um, but you and, know, I, I will add, Ellen, that I am so happy that you have the area for documenting um, what's in the piece that you are uploading. You know, you can think that you're lazy and you're in a hurry uh, and you don't put that little bit of information there, but you will regret it. I, I must emphasize, please do it. Please take the extra 15 seconds to list what it is and why it's special. And that's all. At least you have that. Then you can come back later and, and add more if you like. But I have done it myself. I have neglected to label tapes. And then I, I go around and I go, what's on here? And you don't know. And so now you might have to sit through the whole tape to try and find out what's on there. Or and you wish 20 years ago you had labeled it. So please label your information when you upload it. You will be so happy with yourself that you did it. <laughs> you get a gold star. <laughs> right. Gold star for a future self. That's great. Yeah. Um, 
And a third story sharing tip that you shared with me was about embracing, embracing the unknown objects. What is known is what is more important for story sharing. Can you elaborate on that? Well, we, you know, we find that many times by not labeling, by not being careful with the items that we have, we don't know what they are and the symbolism. I had a family um, say to me, you know, Bob, uh, there are some boxes in the basement. Why don't you just go through those and see what you find? So I went down there and I saw these 16 millimeter reels of film in a box. And I thought, why would they say those unless they were important? So I got two or three of those along with some other items that I found. I took the, the film, had it digitized. And when we were screening it, there, this, there was the uh, CEO the, of this family who is 94 years old now, but there was a picture of him when he was about 17 years old, standing over a vat of cosmetics, stirring this big vat of cosmetics. They had forgotten it was there, but it was taken um, in the 20s or 30s, and uh, someone came in with a film camera. They had forgotten they, they had it, they threw it in a box. So a lot of the unknown can really be very, very valuable, but it goes back to, it wasn't labeled. And they lost, you know, what it was. And many times these are the pieces that get thrown out because um, my wife, uh, who's a librarian and is very neat and tidy, over the years has come through my office, as you can see <laughs> how I am. I'm just this far away from being a hoarder. <laughs> and Sharon, bless her heart, has come through my things. And later I'll say, hey, Sharon, do you know what's happened to my so-and-so? And she'll, no, no, no. But I can guess that she and my daughter <laughs> Karen probably did a little house cleaning. You know, that's good, but check with people first because you never know what can be really important and meaningful to people. It's the unknown items, which sometimes are really, really important. And talk with each other, find out because chances are you kept it for a reason. Mm -hmm. And, um, or your mom kept it for a reason. <clears throat> and you need to know why. And mm -hmm. so um, why did she, why did she have a rolling pin collection? Why did she collect, you know, paper frogs. Why? You know, ask. And because when you ask, there's generally a story that goes along with it. Um, my mother told a story about uh, some items and pictures that she made um, at a uh, Maasai tribe in Africa. She had asked someone in her group to get a photo of her, and she kind of edged up next to the chief who was standing there talking and she was trying to get in the frame. And one of his wives who was sitting there making these bricks of urine and cow dung, that uh, that's what they were made out of, just got a handful of it and threw it at mama, who was getting her out of the way from standing next to the chief. And so she tells that story about uh, being shushed out of the way um, by urine and cow dung. Now, I don't know of anyone else who's had anything like that happen. But those <laughs> are the stories that sometimes can happen that add a little bit of zest to why the person collected what it was that they did. We That's fully agree, Bob. The stories are <laughs> so important. Right. Um, if you So for our members who may have a lot of stuff and a lot of stories, and maybe they're feeling overwhelmed about where to start, do you have any tips on where, if you're faced with, you know, like the study that you have, bookshelves full of memories and things, where do you start? Where would you like to start when working with a family? Where do you, where do you kind of point them in the right direction to get going? I really don't know. That's a tough one. There are companies that can help you with that. And um, Ellen, you guys have a board member who um, I just attended a conference and um, 
what's his name? Pat Paxton. Uh, yes, he has a show on PBS. Um, yeah, we just downsized our home. We, uh, Sharon and I, are <clears throat> just um, decided uh, you know we we could downsize, and so we have. And so I, you know, had I had a library, a real real library that, um, and I had to go through and thin out books. And that was that was really 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 hard to do, um, and so uh, as you see, I haven't. I still have a lot of them all around that I haven't been able to get rid of, and uh, and I've added so many more um, as I read. I read all the time, and so I don't. I, Matt can tell you there's there, you can do it sort of like a, a triage, you know, the ones that you haven't had anything to do with. Ah, get rid of them. The ones that, um, you know, you might pick up now and then and you want to pass on to someone else, maybe. Although, and so maybe you can have a, a way of selecting it that way. It's, it's just very hard to do, I think. Um, I don't have any secrets for you on that, on downsizing, because I'm not very good at it myself. <laughs> But when you're talking about the stories, like getting families to start sharing the stories with you when oh, you're, yes. you know, you're, you're sitting there, you're videotaping them, you're making the documentaries, where do you start with them? How do you get them talking? Like, what do you, what is your kicking off point that gets them going and thinking about their story, their history? Well, many times uh, families have already begun to realize the importance of documenting the family history. <clears throat> and it is so interesting. I bet you, if you did a poll and asked everyone who's in attendance here tonight, what they thought of their family histories, what they know of it, and is it an important story? I bet you 99.9% .9 would say, yeah, we have an important story. And you know what? They're right, they do. And it, is how you tell it. And then we do it, you know, documentary style, which is, you know, set up to make it like a movie. But you don't have to tell them in that manner. You can just do an interview with dad. You can do an interview with mom. You can isolate those two interviews and um, you can save them. Uh, try not to make them too long. Because if they're too long, the kids, this new generation has an attention span of maybe that long. And they're not going to spend a lot of time. You know, this is the TikTok generation, you know, 15 seconds is, they're, they're done. So, but they, they will sit through a family video because it's people they know and it's stories they've heard about. And we are all curious about our histories. So people will sit through um, a longer version of that story than they would something else, somebody else's story. So um, getting them interested in it, really, Heather is asking them questions about their childhood. What is it that you know about grandma that you could tell me that I don't know? What have you heard? Did you hear any any great things? I, you know, I knew she was head of this organization. Did you hear anything about that? You know, you, you get them thinking about what they might know that you don't know. And then that gets them to uh, begin to think about it. And even in cases of family squabbles, which we have encountered, where families aren't talking, many times you can get cousin so-and-so to sit for an interview um, they may not come over to your house, but they may let you come over and sit for an interview because they know what's going on in that side of the family. And don't try to take sides in the interview. Let them tell what it is they think, if necessary, happen. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, with people having trust today, I, I've always felt that very thoughtful trust attorneys should, when there is a um, major event in the family of a birth, a death, a marriage, um, or those types of events. 
that's when they should ask the family, what have you done about your legacy lately? Have you done any more to update it? Because that's very important and trust people are there. They, uh, they know about the financial aspects of the family, but what about the, 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 the theoretical aspects of the family? Uh, Jewish families have for years uh, done what we call um, living wills, when they will ask questions, not about what are you giving me, what material things are you giving me, but what are you, what can you pass on to me that are important theoretical thoughts? For instance, um, what are your thoughts about faith? What are your thoughts about uh, money? What are your thoughts about uh, raising children? Um, what are your thoughts about honesty and hard work? Those are things that people can sit down and pass on to their children, which are really, really important. And kids get a lot out of that uh, because it gives them an idea of how grandpa thought, what grandma really was like when she tells you about her recipes, but why this, this box was so important that she kept. And at the same time, why was grandma so strict about making sure we all were here every Sunday for dinner? Why did she make sure that there was no goofing around at the table? You know, those kinds of questions you can ask and it gives you an idea of how people think. And that you don't get often when you just bequeath material things. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of other living wills are really important to pass on to uh, relatives as well. And those thoughts can be stored on artifacts because they don't have to be long. They can, you can have a photo and then you can add your thoughts about grandma said, I remember grandma because she taught me about blah, blah. Uh, grandpa was a great a believer in blah, blah, blah. And now you've added some other sides to him that gives it a different depth than what just the photo offers. Mm -hmm. So Bob, if you've inspired people to go home this weekend and to talk with their parents, their grandparents, what if they happen to be a little bit nervous in front of the camera? You've got decades of experience being in front of the lens. Any words of wisdom for how do you combat nerves? How do sure. you things do or don't do? How do you put someone at ease when they're suddenly staring at the lens of the camera? Well, I wouldn't do it so they're staring at the lens of the camera. You set it up, you know, just have it there. And pretty soon you don't see it. So if you say, um, you know, I'm, let's set a date for next Tuesday when we're going to sit down and uh, you're going to let me ask you just a few questions and then I'll let you ask me some questions. You know, and in the case of a family, they may fear that you're going to ask something that uh, may embarrass them. So say, write down seven, eight questions and say, here, these are the questions I want to ask you. But then say, just to let them know, you know, many times though, I'll follow up um, your answer with another question because it's always going to lead you down a different path. Uh, when people ask me for questions, I always tell them, you know, I can give you the questions, but I respond to your answers with additional questions based on what you say, because I listen to what you say. So it's, it's be careful that you listen. Don't be so busy that you're not paying attention to what they're saying, because when you listen to their answers, many times that's going to take you in another direction. And then there's something called the golden moment. Let me tell you about that. When you get into this conversation and you are, and you ask them something that's really important and you can sense that they are telling you something that they feel is important and they'll get to the end. Don't just jump right in with another question. Let that little silence, that, that awkward silence, and then they'll say something else. 
that's the golden moment when they've gotten to the end of what they were saying then they'll say something else. And when they say that something else, that's the nugget. That's the best part that you were waiting on. It's usually a summation of all of their thoughts. So wait for that golden moment when you ask a question and give them a chance to answer. Um, but as I was getting, but if you can put the camera back there over your shoulder on a tripod or something, just have it, you know, grandpa's not on, let's just sit here, talk about something else and uh, say, you know, I'm going to turn it on. Now, after you've been sitting there for five minutes then say, you know what, that was really good. What you just said was really good. Can you say that again? I'm going to turn the camera on. Now you turn the camera on and ask that same question again. And so they'll say it. Now they're off and rolling and um, you've got them because now they know it doesn't hurt. And, uh, and so they'll start talking and then you can just, you know, go about it easily and um, listen though, listen. Don't, don't get so busy that you're not paying attention. If you listen, they're gonna tell you where to go next with your questions. And, um, if you have a, an aim uh, that you're going for, you know, you can have that in the back of the mind. But listen, did you get a good answer because they may not have given it to you? You can say, well, but you know, what about so-and-so? So you've asked it again. And then maybe the, this is the time they'll tell you, well, what really happened? And okay, without being too confrontational. You don't want to do that because you've lost them then. Um, you know, I used to watch, I've always seen some TV reporters go out trying to get them hard nosed. Nah, no. That I've, was had great, I've had great interviews. I've interviewed presidents. I've interviewed royalty over the years. And I always get the great interviews by being friendly and, and affable and understanding that they're talking to you as a friend and you're listening to them. And they, 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 that's in a family member, especially, they'll get it. So the other you, they'll tell you everything. They'll tell you where they keep the, uh, the sack of gold. And it's not under the, under the tree, it's over there under the other part. <laughs> You know, Bob, um, your story there and your golden nugget reminded me recently, I was meeting with someone who does grief counseling and, and works on end of life preparations. And he told me that the silence waiting for the silence, letting them make eye contact again, when they're going through a really emotional grief stricken story, waiting for them to re-engage and make the eye contact. Right. And, and never breaking a physical contact boundary, you know, not necessarily putting your hand on the shoulder or, right. or whatever to comfort and not breaking that kind of bubble of, of protection that they're in in the moment. And, and he brought this to my attention because, you know, um, often with artifacting, we'll, we'll, we'll do concierge artifacting and help people artifact. And sometimes it is after a loss. And, you know, I said to him, you know, getting to the stories that they want to share and letting them have the emotional space they need to share them. That's a learning process, right? Heather and I are not grief counselors. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was great advice for those who are trying to work with people about very emotional stories. And re recently on artifacts, I encourage everyone to check it out. There's a new public artifact. It's a photograph from the day the Romanian revolution started. And this woman is recounting it from her childhood. And, it, and it's a very emotional descriptive telling. And, and I think that there's a lot of folks with it being family history month who are reflecting on their family history, their family heritage, and there's those emotional pieces. And I think that what we've discovered is artifacting can be a private place or in this case, a public because it's a piece of world history that this person felt comfortable sharing. Um, I think that you can, you can also tell people you have private space here and, 
and we don't need to share that video mom with the world. It's for us, right? I think that private recollection space is really important to, to safeguard. You know, but I think, and I'm sure you guys have discovered that there are people who have artifacting as a hobby. And I think in terms of my cameraman who is a Trekkie and uh, so he was warped as a child somewhere along the way because he has every known item, probably has more than Spielberg and not Spielberg, it's the other guy. Um, uh, <laughs> but he's got his, his home, his basement is full of CPOs and all those kinds of things. So, and he doesn't know about artifacts, but I'm, his wife is going to thank me so much <laughs> when I turn him on to artifacts and he can get all of this stuff uploaded up to the line. <laughs> you know, one of our top artifactors, and there's a great story because who wants 300 miniature pianos? And we tell you in that, she got artifacts as a gift from her son-in-law who said, all of that stuff, it's not coming to my house. So here's artifacts, go figure it out. <laughs> We understand. Bob, right. there's a question in the chat. When you are working with a family, how long does your process take from beginning to end? Uh, on average, we say eight months, six to eight months. Um, but it many times takes over a year because we don't rush the families and we do um, a process at the end where we give them the finished video to screen for corrections, additions, deletions, and that sort of thing, because we may have dates incorrect, or they may not like a picture that we used here that they'd rather see there, all of these different little things. So then they make those changes because we have time code at the bottom of the, um, of the, the, the version that we give them for screening. And so they can write down at one minute, 30, at one hour, 20 minutes and 52 seconds, there's a photo box. So we can make those changes, get it back to them. And if they still have more changes, we do it until they're 100% satisfied. So um, many times it can take eight months, it can take six months, but on we we've had them go longer than a year when I know they travel and call and say, you know what, we were set up to do this interview, but can we push it back? And it's fine with us. Uh, it's just uh, throws it later for them. And so, um, it, but it takes me about a month to a month to five weeks to write one. Uh, and then I do a rewrite. And uh, then it takes the crew, if we are on just a, a you know, a really fast one, um, they may be able to edit uh, in about two, maybe three months. So that's working a, a lot. It's working fast because we we use um, gear where the editing phase we have, I don't know if you've ever seen edits where we, we may have five or 10 different lines of, of editing code of, one is a narration, one is a layer. They're in layers, layers of, um, uh, of material that is being edited together. One would be the soundtrack, another would be uh, the A-roll, another would be my narration. So all of these are layers. And so it, it helps them to go in and um, because we use the best in editing gear and, um, and 4K cameras and so forth. So their they're broadcast quality, um, movies when we finish with them and um you know the families love them we're trying to figure out a way to do um some that are not as costly because i would like to become the mcdonald's of <laughs> of, of bio of bio family biographies but you know we, we're not going to be able to do that um not on the the level that we do them and um so we have to, you know, ours are just handmade and they, you know, to get a handmade suit, you, you know, there's a lot of that's involved in that. So, um, you know, that's, it's, they are, 
and they're done like you would see a Hollywood movie done. And uh, but they're they're really, I was I had to go back and screen one the other day, and I was screening it with my wife, and <clears throat> and I was watching it, and I turned to it, and I thought it was like I I'd gotten lost. I thought I was watching a movie or something. I said, "This is one of ours." I said, "Wow, this is really good." <laughs> and I've forgotten that we did that. And, um, you know, and, I, and I've watched them over and over and over again during the editing process, but, you know, it takes a while. Um, and we, we spend time with our families, we get to know them. Um, I had a family that uh, suffered an awful tragedy uh, back uh, in the 90s, 12 members of the family died in an airplane crash. And they were just a wonderful, wonderful family. And um, they had come to me and asked me to put this together. Um, and I used chapter seven as the, uh, the dealing with the crash chapter. And I can remember sitting there writing and tears were streaming down my face and I was writing, I had gotten to know them that well. And, um, you know, it was, it was an amazing story. They were really such wonderful people. And uh, so you, you, you get to know families one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, they tell us their secrets, you know, and, you know, we stress confidentiality with them. We don't even use their names. Uh, when we get a family, we give them a nickname and we don't even use their names. Um, you know, even in our correspondence with me and the crew and that sort of thing. So, and, and today uh, we use drones and um, all kinds of, you know, you don't have to use helicopters. And um, so it's, you know, they're, they're just, there's so much fun to do. And I'm doing it for my daughter and her husband. They are journalists. My daughter is the weekend anchor here in Chicago and her husband, she's on the ABC station. He's on the NBC station. And so um, we, um, you know, we, we get their grandkids. My wife just walked in after taking the, their children home so that they have the kids have dinner with us. I pick them up from school, help them with homework and, uh, you know, we get them back home. So I'm building this company for them because television news is changing so much. And I don't want to get off the subject. That's, a, that's for another- uh, I was like, another that might be a whole other one. <laughs> But you're building a legacy for them and you're recording right. theirs. I love it. Um, Bob, this has been such a pleasure having you here this evening. It's um, it's humbling that you said yes. We are, love all of your story sharing tips um, and experiences. I think we could also do a whole segment on your favorite interviews. I was very tempted to take that path tonight, but uh, it might well, take us too far afield. <laughs> I love what you and Heather are doing. I'm telling you, I predict that um, you think Facebook is big. You think uh, Twitter is big. You guys are going to squash them all. I mean, you are just wait. As more and more people find out how wonderful you have this, it's going to take off. And you serve a really, really great service um, because I, I think your, your costing is, is fabulous. I think you really thought this through and uh, it's just great. And, uh, you know, people who do this, I think, love it and uh, are going to do it more and more. And, um, and you're helping people. You're helping people preserve their histories. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. And it's our oh, pleasure. Congratulations. Hats off to you guys. Thank you so much. Heather, do you want to take it away for the evening and give everyone a preview for next week? Can't hear you. <laughs> it turns out I was still on mute. So final tip of the evening, unmute yourself before you turn on the camera. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that, thank you all for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bob, for sharing again all your tips, your tricks, your words of wisdom, and your experiences from decades being both in front and behind the camera. And next week, Ellen and I hope that all of you will join us again, same time, same day of the week, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific for our next Evenings with Artifacts. We will be featuring um, Gina Philibert, and she is an amazing 
food historian. Um, she focuses on family history, women's history, and she'll be discussing the ins and outs of how she researches these themes and help families document their history and their story through the recipes of their lives. Um, both Ellen and I are, uh, we love to cook, so we are giddy about this session, and we can't wait to welcome Gina to the Artifact stage. So we hope you join us next week. The invitations will follow via email. And again, Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And as a reminder, we will have the recording on our YouTube channel starting tomorrow morning if you want to go back and visit Bob's tips or view any of the previous evenings with artifacts. So with that, we bid you all good night. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you guys, too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>